Hello and welcome. My name is Noreen Conway and I'm Acting Manager at Galway Technology Centre. So with the support of IMS Financial Services, GTC are delighted to host guest speakers Bernard Brogan and Nilo Carroll for a fireside chat where they will explore the connection between high performance teams, relationships and culture. So a big virtual welcome to Galway guys. Sorry we can't have you here in person but there'll be again. This session uh, forms part of GTC's Wellness Week, where we have already hosted uh, Tom Coleman, the sleep coach uh, webinar, and Patty McHugh with a health and safety uh, session on best practices working remotely, both of which you can listen back to on our GTC uh, YouTube channel. So these events, together with today's fireside chat, are our way of acknowledging the strength, resilience and cooperation over the past 12 months of our GTC members and our wider community. So let me introduce you to today's guest speakers. Bernard Brogan. Bernard is a qualified chartered accountant and hosts a master's in business management and marketing. A serial entrepreneur, Bernard is co-founder of Pep Talk and commercial director. He also co-owns the fast growing PR agency, Legacy Communications. He holds a number of other business interests, both in Ireland and abroad. He is a past president of the Irish Sport Federation and an active ambassador and supporter of the Charity Aware, amongst other charitable activities. Bernard has played with Dublin for over a decade, earning seven All-Ireland medals, 13 Leinster medals and four GAA Football All-Star Awards, as well as the 2010 Footballer of the Year. So you're very welcome, Bernard. Thanks, Amelia, for having me. So second, we have Niall O'Carroll, Niall has been responsible for developing and driving high performance programs for both corporate and sporting organizations around the world, including the number one sales team in Canada, a world championship winning team and 27 individual Olympic champions. Niall has honed his expertise working across three continents, maybe four, helping his clients in the pursuit of excellence. Niall has also provided mental skills consultancy to a number of organizations, including, as we were talking just before we came on, the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, Toronto Blue, Blue Jays, the Auckland Blues rugby franchise, I believe, the Elm, Elmhurst Royal Ballet, of school, Ballet School, and the world-renowned Cheatham School of Music. Passionate about philanthropy, Niall also partnered with Don Roy, voted the number one golf coach in Canada in 2016 to develop the Junior Development Programme, aimed at supporting underage athletes in achieving scholarships for U.S. colleges. Niall um, was a mindset advisor to the Battle Back program in Lille Hall, UK, which is a residence-based emotional and physical coaching program focused on supporting soldiers in physical and mental recovery post-deployment and conflict. So Niall and Bernard, you're both very welcome. I think if there was ever a time to have an applaud button on Zoom, you know, <laughs> after hearing those bios. I'm even impressed, and I've heard that before. That's a... <laughs> Absolutely. So just a little housekeeping before the guys start. Um, if you have any questions uh, during or after the presentation, uh, Niall and Bernard said, just please pop them into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And Brian um, from IMS Financial Services or Niall will bring them up um, during and at the end. So, without further ado, I'll turn you over to Bernard and I. Thanks, Noreen. Um, wow, what an intro. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think um, when, when you look at the, the, the two resumes that have just been called out, the, uh, the key takeaway is that my job is to facilitate people in delivering performance, and Bernard has been the one who has delivered the performance. People have often asked me about my my greatest successes in sport and it has always been about watching other people achieve things. Um, Bernard on the other hand is the genuine star of the show because Bernard has gone and won pretty much everything you can win whilst maintain like whilst doing a accountancy degree and then running businesses and um, it's all it's all really impressive um, but one of the things and, and I think it's a nice place to start is if we think about um, Bernard Throughout the five in a row and throughout your career, really, you were kind of a leader in the Dublin team, whether it was, you know, in the early days as the guy who got the scores to, in, you know, your last couple of seasons where you were kind of one of the senior players who kind of 
led the younger lads coming through and, and, and you know, helped, helped develop this environment where Dublin were pretty much invincible. But what would you say are the key skills you've learned as a player that you have transferred into the business world now? Yeah, um, it's a good question to start with. I suppose a couple of things that kind of that, that, that stick out to me, and you say it there about leadership um, and management. Um, I know you've got some great theories on this, but for me, from sport, understanding the difference between what, what a manager does and what a leader does, and <clears throat> leadership can come from everywhere in the organisation. And Jim Gavin, who's and Pat Gilroy before him, and Peter Caffrey before him, from my time over 15 years with Dublin. Uh, it was amazing, but their job was they would not even see themselves as facilitators, even though they were managers, they would always see themselves, as you would say, a facilitator to performance, and they would want leaders all around the place, um, be on the pitch, be it people who, who don't play, who lead in training, be that, that don't travel to the game, are as important as the people who put the ball over the bar or to make the saves. Um, understanding that dynamic and understanding that you need leaders um, from young and old. I think the dynamic we got with Dublin that was was the driver of our success was that the young people uh, that came into the team were empowered to to be the best they could be and that saying is if you're old enough you're good enough or if you're good enough you're old enough there was never there was never a case of serving your time or you had to be a certain age. They were brought into the group they were they were put under pressure to lead. They were asked questions. They were asked to input into conversations. They were asked to give their opinions on plays and dynamics on the ways to break things down. And that created a culture of, of that equality and um, that there was no hierarchy. There was no, there was no, um, there was no like kind of, yeah, that the, the um, place where you, just because you're there, you need to get your place. It was always done on the person who got the, jer who, who was playing the best got the jersey. And that was, that was a very equal and a very, performance-led environment, which meant that the whole performance of the team drives up. And the other piece for me personally, that I, and I learned a lot of it late, very late in my career, um, was a self-awareness piece about understanding your, your, your strengths and understanding your weaknesses. Um, and also that you need the people around you and you need that team. And I love playing for a team because we had, we had um, Need people to rely on. I always envy, and you've worked with, with loads of them, those individual sport athletes that can get up in the morning and do that hard graft and, and train so hard. I needed that. I needed the people around me to drive me on. I needed that team environment. I needed the fun, the energy, the crack. That was all very important for me. But also that, that self-awareness piece that I knew, my, I knew my strengths and I knew my weaknesses more, 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 more importantly. And when I tried to bring into business and I started started Legacy first and, and then uh, Pep Talk. It was very much about having that team around me that, that I knew where my strengths were. I'm, I'm an accountant by trade um, so I'm good at numbers. I'm good at the fundamentals of business. Um, I'm quite personable. I'm outgoing. I'm good at I think I'm good at sales and um, the sport has provided me a great opportunity to open doors. It's been amazing like that. The GA community in, in Ireland is every business in, in, in Ireland and, and a lot abroad will, <laughs> will open a door for you, which is amazing. And uh, we don't probably utilize it enough as, as, as sports people, but bringing people around me to basically to, to help drive the business. Like I'm not great at detail. I'm not, there's loads of stuff I'm not good at in my, in my day to day. Uh, and I think understanding that and building a team around you um, with people of other strengths was one of the core things that we learned in sport because you had to do it because you needed people to get you, get you there. There was times in early my days where I did all the scoring, but we weren't getting there. I was getting all the glory. I was getting all the scores and everyone thought I was great, but we weren't winning uh, we, when I came up against it we weren't good enough, you know, and when we really, and Pat Gilroy did a lot of work with me personally and put a lot of pressure on me to, to ask more, to, to work harder for the team, to bring people into it, to not, to make good decisions. Uh, and he, he used me as a, as a catalyst to drive that message through the organization of, of Dublin. And um, so those type of messages, yeah, probably long winded answer, but um, self-awareness a piece and then that, that manager versus leader and the difference between them uh, is really important to me. I think it is, and I think it's really interesting, you know, like, I mean, I'm, uh, my role in Pep Talk is I'm responsible for everything that goes in the app. I'm kind of responsible for some of the strategic direction. And one of the things we've been investigating uh, with one of the leading neuroscientists in the States is ways of measuring soft skills and how they impact on companies and their performance and their relationships and their culture. 
And one of the stories you shared in your book, which I think is really lovely, is, is kind of, it speaks lovely to that, which is the, you spoke about Jim and his approach to the performance trinity. Mm. Can you kind of develop that out a little bit? Yeah, it was a really nice tactic. Actually, Jim came up with um, Jim uh, Gavin was uh, in the army, so he he had a lot of great, I suppose, leadership um, people around him or styles, uh, and probably learned a lot of his trade that way. But he had came up with this um, performance trinity, as as you say, and it was about the three most important things for us as players. Obviously, we were there as sports people, and we wanted to win and and, and do and do good stuff at Dublin. But he believed that that to get true high performance and sustained high performance, which is the key, because we were trying to do a year, we had a bit of success, and we were trying to do it continuously over time. And to sustain high performance, you need to. That's where culture comes in. That's where behaviors, values, all that stuff gets cashed in. You say cash in on your culture, and that's the area where he said, look at your performance trinity. So, what are the three most important things? for you and everyone on the call as I'm talking think about the three most important things are in your, in your life for me it was obviously sport we were there sports people so that was one of them family friends but for, obviously family mainly I'd say was was our other one and then for me it was work I was an entrepreneur I was trying to build biz, build a business and for some people it was studies it was a lot of obviously students a lot of different people so that was my three things and what, what Jim actively and um, did was he looked at those other aspects yes we did the work for on the pitch and we did the skills based stuff and all, all the bits and pieces but he has much had a thought process around the other two two areas that are important in our lives because he believed that if we have balance in all of those areas at the top of the spear we will get the performance and the continued performance so for example what does that mean Every Christmas, he would send a card and a small gift to the loved ones. Any social event we had, the family members, um, partners, if there was partners, mothers and fathers, kids were always invited to, after a game, they're invited in to meet the team, to, 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 to enjoy the energy. Any, any holidays away, weekends away, not every time, everything was about was family orientated because he, knew, he felt that the family sacrifice more than we do as sports people. We we get to run into Crow Park for 80,000 people. Well, they didn't this year, but uh, um, we did for so long and a million people watching at home and to do the thing we love. And, and, and obviously that's, we're living our dreams, you know. Um, but the sacrifice is those at home, as people with kids or families or people who who, who mop up at home and, 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 uh, and keep the show on the road, you know. So he was conscious of that and he wanted to make the people at home uh, or families feel supported and feel like they're that they were part of the, the journey and uh, feel like they had an outlet there was a liaison officer a uh, one per period that was actually contacting the families and just keeping updated with things that were happening if it was weekend away giving them plenty of notice literally small really small stuff but made a big difference that when i was leaving my young kids at the end two baby twins and i was going out the door and kira was there with two crying babies she never really she knew what i loved it and she was always going to support me as as most partners and families would do but she knew that she knew there was a higher purpose there and and, and that really gave energy and I suppose that the other piece then was this, the work or the studies if you're a student and you had exams coming up or you had a big assignment uh, you flag it Jim would say I'll see you take a week off or come back next Thursday after training or after you finish that exam or if I was traveling with pep talk to the, to the UK or wherever it was if you're in a long uh, uh, drive if you're traveling up and down the country you take the night off, you have a light session, you go to the gym. Yes, there's, there was injury prevention piece, but more so was that you felt supported, that you got after the things that were important to you and the other side of life. We, are, we, are amateur, we were an our amateur and we did have to, to, he wanted us to pro progress in our lives and to not forget about that side of it. Um, so sorry, yeah, that was that kind of performance trinity that he felt that, and it's the same in the workplace and what the work that Pep Talks were doing, I'm sure not many people on the call know it, it's, it's, it's a company founded to support the human side of work and drive that cultural piece and help organisations get after that. And it's very much about, as you say there, softer skills, relationships, what is culture about? And if you are, obviously our organisations want you to perform and that's why you're there as a job and that's why you're paid. And how do you, how do you, how do you, activate or support that performance because there's so many challenges and, and last year more than any emotional stress financial all of these type of things and what we try and do in pep talk is how do we facilitate that through content through gamification through fun through on demand obviously been an application technology and how do you try and do that and that's 
that learning, that lessons was was very in part, Jim, and that performance trinity about the individual in the middle. How do you get the best out of them? And to do that, they need to feel balanced because. I always say, people say, what, like, what do you say to people when they want to play well or get into the zone? We're, all, we're always trying to get back into the zone. I say, play like a kid. When you play like a kid, kids have no worries. They're just out there in the field, playing away, playing, putting their jerseys down and they kick, kick balls into the net. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's when you play well, when you don't have the stress of real life in the way. And the same in the workplace. If you're carrying in, we always say in pep talk, no one leaves their baggage at the door at nine o'clock and then picks it up at half five. We want the whole person to work because that's the creativity, the emotion, the relationships, all of that good stuff. And that's what um, we want them in the sports pitch as well. And that's what we try and do in pep talk is, is unearth that real conversations. I know, I know you're, you're, you, you would be massively uh, advocate for that around what is culture. It is around relationships, conversations, and the ability to have a trust. And, and that's when you have a high performance team, when you can have that back and forth, that feedback, that trust. And then that's, I suppose, um, yeah. And it, and it is, you know, I mean, you, you've, you've mentioned before that, that culture lives and dies in middle management. And, mm. and I think you were talking about from the point of view of, of trust and, and, and vulnerability. And I think a lovely story that kind of ties into that and um, it's very much in keeping with our philosophies about the corporate world, but it was something that you guys did the weekend before mm. or the two weekends before the, the five in a row all Ireland final. Um, your trip to the island. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and I think the biggest, the most, as you say, the middle management piece. Um, in organisations, we can have the best words on the back of the wall, or we can write our purpose and, and all that. But the culture of an organisation is is the interactions, it's the relationships, the respect, and middle managers are are the driving force of of culture because they are the people who 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 give feedback to their to the to the teams who give their holidays, their bonuses, all that stuff they are. And uh, so they are an important measure of, of a culture and organization. And, and in Dublin, we, like, so there's no middle management, but it's every player had that role to be, to, be, to be driving that cultural piece. And as you say there, like two weeks out from the five in a row, Jim felt, in fairness to him, he felt that we couldn't. It's all about marginal gains, high performance, about what will give you the best output for the time, especially when you're amateur and you don't, you can't spend all day doing it. When we meet, we want to get as punchy a session done and, and get as much value out of it. And we had a weekend and he said he believed that we could kick points all day long. Are we going to get marginally better in that space? Or if we went to the gym and lifted weights, are we going to get marginally stronger? in that space and he felt the most marginal game you could get was that connection piece was that really really understanding each other sometimes when you're on the, when you're on in the workplace as well as on a sports team i was there 15 years and especially people in the workplace you forget that people are, are new to a place sort of come in at a different level and they don't not everyone has been around for for that long and you have to re 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 unearth different things different conversations that have been had and we've had loads of them over the years but they're sporadic because there's a, probably a core core group of uh, on the team like that, but so we went away. We went off to Lambay Island, uh, which is an amazing place just off the shores of, of Dublin, um, and the east east the beautiful east coast of Ireland for all of um, the Westies on the call here, um, and we went over there and we did two or three sessions around connection. And I was about as you say, their vulnerability people. It wasn't about about loss. It wasn't about tragedy, but people just opened up. We had conversations. People spoke about losing loved ones. Michael Darren McCauley's both mother and father passed away. His dad father passed away um, a couple of years ago. Um, did what didn't get a transplant in time, a lung transplant that he was waiting for. Brent Fenton spoke about passing of his mother, who's very obviously very close. So that was recent years, and again, not about loss, but just vulnerability. <clears throat> be it about loss or be it about a behavior or be it about not knowing something is the most powerful way of building trust, I believe, and building connection. And especially as, as leaders, as managers or um, in organizations, like if, if I'm leading a team, if I show vulnerability, I don't have all the answers. Let's, let's work on this together. You're building trust. So that, that, that's a couple of sessions we did uh, for that weekend was only what well, was only kind of small conversations, but I believe that when, yeah, when it comes, where you cash that in is when the last five minutes of a game, when you kind of, somebody makes a mistake or you slip or a ball hits off a bar, something happens, that you will just go the extra mile for that individual because 
you've gone to the well, we've done the hard training, we've done the slog, but you, you deeply, deeply know their inner demons, you understand their challenges, or you just connect as, from a friendship point of view and you just really, really just, and, and it's not even all of those, but liking people. There was loads of people well-documented on that Dublin team. There's loads of battles and digger matches and all, all sorts of stuff, but I guarantee you there was respect there. In that, in, from, from those people, when we went, when they went into training with Dublin, or they went onto the pitch, there was a respect there and a trust there to get the job done. As I said, they don't, not everyone liked each other, and in the workplace, I'm sure there's loads of t- high performance teams that people might be the best of friends. They don't have to drink pints on a Friday night together or on a Zoom call, but it, as long as you can build a, an environment of trust and that that person is doing what's best for the organisation, and um, that's when you have true high performance, and that's what we got to with Dublin. Um, over the last last couple of years, yeah, and I think it's it, it, it's something that I found in my career, but but pretty much everywhere I've worked, is that you know I, I always talk about um, leadership and 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 I use the word care, mm-hmm. and people kind of sometimes get oh God, this is going to get all lovey now, and and you know, and and I'm I'm actually one of those people that even though like our company falls into the well being space. I'm not somebody who loves the word well being because it automatically kind of you get this connotation of you know, something soft and, and, you know, don't, don't go too hard on people. And really what my job was as a mental skills coach was to give players um, and athletes tools to deliver on their performance, to head all the physical training, all the extra skill training, all that other stuff. My job was to get them ready mentally. But then if they didn't perform, they still, there was still the same outcome. Like it's not about making life easy for people. It's about a, a appreciating that everybody has tra- challenges and struggles in their lives. And one thing that we've kind of missed in the, in, in the, in the business world, I feel, is that we, we've, we lose sight of the fact that our work, you know, we work, uh, I, 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 I was looking at research there recently, and like out of 168 hours in a week, we typically work uh, on, an, on a typical nine to five, you'd work about 47 of them. Now we know we're walking, like the research tells us we're working 40% longer hours in lockdown, which then if, you're, if you are getting eight hours sleep a night, if you're fortunate enough to get an eight hours sleep a night and sleep is so important to performance and that's a whole different conversation. But if you are getting eight hours sleep a night, you know, you've suddenly gone in, gone over a hundred hours of work and sleep. So then you're left with about 60 hours a week for your family and for your homeschooling, and for your, you know, your hobbies, your challenges, you know, the things you're trying to do, things you're trying to better yourself. And it's insane that in the workplace, we don't acknowledge that these challenges exist. And it's not about making life easy for people, but it's about understanding what they are, and then figuring it out. And there's a question here for you that I'm going to ask you from um, Adrian. Um, it's, uh, just one second now, I'll bring it back up, because there's a few questions coming in. Um, yeah, it, it, it relates to kind of the vulnerability and the trust. And I think there's an old, the old school way of thinking about leadership, which, you know, our management is that, you know, you can't be too close to the, 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 the people working for you and you can't have these relationships. And, you know, you need to have all the answers because, you know, you're the leader. Whereas the great leaders in sport and in business, and there's, there's really cool stuff about uh, Lou Gershner at IBM when he took over and IBM was pretty much in the toilet when he took over. And, he hired a bunch of executives around him who were experts in their area. And then his board meetings were him sitting with those guys saying, I don't understand your area. You tell me. And he just kept asking questions and he gave everybody an environment to thrive. And I think that's really cool. And I think it's, uh, it's something that we could all learn from is that idea that, you know, like what Jim was doing with the, the performance Trinity, what he was doing with the, the, the trip to the island and all the vulnerability stuff was actually giving you guys the space. First of all, the trust in each other that you would do it for each other, which, you know, in that, in that first game in the All-Ireland final, you know, Kerry should have won that game, you know, and it, it was, it, it, Dublin were in serious trouble, but in the last, I think it's fair, it was the last 10 or 12 minutes, Dublin turned Kerry over about eight times yeah. and Kerry didn't turn over one of Dublin's balls one of their kickouts, like that's the difference between being history makers and being another team who came close but didn't quite get there. Um, but anyway, all of that is, 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 is fascinating. And I could talk on that particular topic. We could talk about that for another hour anyway, but allowing for the fact that we're limited for time and there's some really cool questions coming in. I just wondered, um, Adrian asked here, um, and this is kind of from your own vulnerability, I suppose, but what have you found most difficult about lockdown? 
Um, <clears throat> the the most difficult thing is probably um, not having my mom and dad in, in our in our circle with two like um, because we two twins, twin boys, and they're electric and, and amazing. And I do get to see we go for a walk at the weekend, the odd time. But I just know how much it's hurt, it's affecting them um, to not see the, the the boys. You know what I mean? Um, so that for me is that's the one that hits me in the in the in the solar plexus. Loads of other challenges of um, of yeah, working obviously with kids at home. Thank God I didn't have the 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 remote schooling, homeschooling stuff, which is just I don't know how people have done that and tried to work as well. But um, yeah, like that has been tough. Obviously, running a business to start a lockdown. We're trying to keep all of our staff um, on the legacy side. It was the marketing business got hammered. Um, but we, we we innovated. We got that sorted, and obviously in pep talk. The, the human side of side of the world um, has been elevated to the boardroom, which is, means that our conversations are landing a lot better, which is great, and we're getting a lot more support from our, from our organisations to actually implement change. Whereas in early days, it's like nice benefit over here, we plug you in. Whereas now it's like this is a cultural investment. So, yeah, for me, sorry to, to answer the question was yeah the most the most difficult thing was was not to have yeah and even. My mom came up the other day with uh, somebody, um, it was actually Brian Mulgoon's mother, actually Violet, had a book for a pal of hers that she, she wanted to sign. So my mom came up and not coming into the house and you have to go out to the garden to sign, to sign a book for them. You know what I mean? That's just, that's where, that's the, that's, that's a piece that was difficult for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, on, on that then, and I still staying on the theme of lockdown, and this is something that, you know, we, 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 we would definitely have a lot of conversations about in Pep, but, um, what advice do you have for managers who, who, who now don't have the connection because of the remote nature of work? You know, most, and we've all experienced this where we're onboarding people, hiring people, onboarding them, and you know, you haven't met them personally. You're, everything is on Zoom. So how, how, how do you manage that in, in your work environment? It's a, it's a really good question. I saw popping up there and it was one definitely worth, worth touching on. Um, this, this, I suppose how the, the, the simple answer to that is about you have to have some real conversations. You have to provide a, a pause in the week or a time in the week where it's not task orientated um, and a genuine kind of try and try and have a genuine conversation. So for a manager with a team, that's an environment, most calls I'm sure about tasks and we need to do this and there's some problem solving. There's probably a little bit of strategy and there's always the first five minutes about how you get on or the challenges as we all have at the first, first few minutes of a call. But how do you have a conscious conversation around a check-in? So make it, and, uh, and talking back to sport about feedback and real conversations and we did it with Dublin a bit. The All Blacks call it permission to enter the danger. It's where you're going to have a real conversation, and I might say something to you that now you don't have to go that hard because we're still it's still soft. But I love that 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 conscious conversation. So you're act you're actually setting a time in the week where we're going to just catch up, and it's not a, it's not at a time that's that's in the evening. It's not a stress. It's in the work environment. It's, it's putting emphasis on it that it's important to be there because we need to just we need to get after this together and have that conversation. Um, in pep talk we're actually sending around and um, we've, we've a manager portal that are actually sending around a powerpoint to actually give you give the managers of our clients the questions to ask in these sessions and a powerpoint and a couple of videos and just to break the ice that's how we're doing it actually to solve and now you, you probably can jump in in there but for me it's about having real conversations and trying to make people feel that they have an environment to, to, to vent. They're not going to, if there's 10 people on a call, they're not going to tell all of their, their worries, but if they feel like there's a, an avenue there, that they will, they'll have a sideline conversation or they'll come to you again. But if they feel like, oh, I even had, a, uh, on the legacy side um, with the team, we had some people to the left, we were probably trying to shield them too much, trying to get the strategy piece done. People didn't, like, you have to bring, you have to have conversations, even like, we're, we're talking about it and we, we're still living in the challenges ourselves you know what I mean so I think it's it's really about about um, making a team feel as if they're they're valued making a feel, team feel as if there's a there's a real connection there and try and build that build that piece or make time for it yeah that's kind of my view on that one now absolutely agree and it's um, it, yeah it, 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 it's the human side of things isn't it it's like we're all we're all struggling through this and, and this third lockdown has been particularly difficult yeah. for everyone 
I think nice, just last in that, and because it says about the, the onboarding piece, and uh, we have obviously a solution in, in Pep Talk, but even a sim- more simpler than that, and we're doing it ourselves in, uh, in, uh, in Pep Talk, and it's a thing I actually brought in from sport, because we started with my club, and it's a day in the life, just for a little takeaway that, that people here with small teams, obviously we're all on WhatsApp, so I'm sure, so sports teams do it all the time so my, my club Plunkets we started doing show us your day so like put five or six pictures up of your day and your nutrition and what you're having and what exercise but I brought it I did it I brought it into the, the, the pep team we've been doing it for about two weeks now and um, and the legacy team and it's just it's just so interesting to see people are all spread out to where they're probably from like there's different different environment you see people's interests you see what their families are like their pets what they're into where they get their coffees and it's just it's just color it's that water cooler piece that we just have gone gone from and to give color and just to start a bit of fun and just even even if no one's really engaging with it it's giving life in the conversation in the day and people like one of the big fallouts to this and that hasn't even the fallout of COVID hasn't even start it hasn't been scratched it but it will be this ma- you hear the massive isolation issues that are happening across um, people male and female and the wor- in the workplace people who are, are away from home but even people young people who are who are at home or, ha- or have friends have family and um, still feeling this massive isolation and mental health and stress so creating color creating opportunities for people to feel part of something bigger than themselves to feel part of that community and um, it is invaluable i feel and i and i don't know now what you what you think of that oh, day in the life as a simple ta- simple t- trick I, to do i think it's lovely um and i think i think the, the 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 key success of it is that it comes back to that caring thing that it's not that you have to like be involved in everybody's personal lives mm. but it's it's that we understand what's going on and and one of the things that we all miss in lockdown i feel is we're all caught up in, like, there's all the, you know, like, basically, if you think about human psychology, our anxiety is either based in the past or things have gone wrong that we carry with us and human beings are brilliant for storing away all these negative thoughts to keep reminding themselves of as they go through life. So we're either caught up in what's happened before, which, if you think about it, has already happened, it's over, it's done, and you can't change it. So why are we giving it oxygen? Or we're worried about what's going to happen in the future. And if you think about lockdown, everything is about, God, when are the vaccines coming out? When is this going to end? When are we going to get back to normal? And we have no control over any of that. The only thing we have control over is the day to day and kind of just balancing on, right? What can I do today to be, you know, healthier, happier, better at what I do? I always ask simple questions like, what can you stop doing that will make you healthier? What can you start doing that will make you happier? Very simple questions for people to kind of focus on, yeah, this is cool. And I think that the, the day in the life thing is a lovely idea because it gets people thinking about, you know, God, I, I have that struggle. Or, yeah, geez, I love that too. Like my big thing at the moment is my kid's got a new puppy. And uh, it's amazing. Like there's nothing that a picture of a puppy can't solve. Like, so <laughs> you stick a picture of a puppy up in the group and everybody then is forgetting their troubles for five seconds because they're all like, oh, that's so amazing. That's amazing. You know, but... It's that simple thing. There's something in, in that moment, people have stopped worrying about all the crap they're dealing with and they're just enjoying that picture. Mm. But why can't we do that on, on a bigger scale? Mm. Why can't we take, you know, like Siobhan Murray, a psychotherapist that we, we do a lot of work with, talks about a worry jar, where she actually says, you write down all your worries, you put them in a jar. And it's not some, you know, airy fairy thing that you, you know, uh, they'll all go away, burn them, they'll be grand. It's she'll devote one hour in the day or one hour in the, in the week or a, a couple of days to saying, I'm going to deal with my worries today. And she opens the jar, she takes out one and she goes, right, what one thing can I do to deal with this particular problem mm. to make it less? And what we often have is that as stresses and pressures build up on us, they become this mushroom cloud of pressure. And usually if you take them out one by one, you can actually deal with them, get rid of them and, and, and lessen the stress. It's like if any of you think back to when you were kids and you were doing the leaving cert, you know, the pressure, the stress building up to the leaving cert. And there's a certain exams that you would have been terrified about. And, 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 and it's all this, this build up of pressure. Then you do the exam, you walk out invariably into this perfect sunshine because the only time the sun ever shone was when we were doing the leaving. But you walk out into the sunshine and you go, actually, that wasn't that bad. So what was all the months of stress about? And that's what we do with ourselves. We build up this, this, this fear. So I think connection and, and, and even like something simple like a day in the life gives people the opportunity to think that, yeah, I'm going to that too. So the pictures might be relating to something like Jesus, I'm stuck in the house again. 
or, you know, I'm getting out for a walk around my garden is the only place I can go. And you're kind of going, Geez, that's all I do. You know, and, and, you know, there's an element of we're all in this together. Um, rather than me rant on now, there's, uh, there's two. Yeah, and thanks, Al and Bernard. Thanks a million for um, your time. Uh, now, just a couple of other questions. I suppose, like one I had put up there, um, Bernard, just as well as it's to do with the, the topic about resilience and motivation. So just your own journey and, and sport, what you can bring maybe to life, I suppose, even business. So you have two examples in your Dublin career. So 2009 and 10, we all remember the start of Leerwigs, Kerry in 2009, Cork, Bet Dublin 2010. So how, like Dublin were, you know, and there's a lot of you guys had lost a couple of years previous. So the resilience and motivation, like what, <laughs> what I suppose obviously the ultimate prize is the All-Ireland, but what, you know, as a team, I suppose that one, what kept you going um, for 2011? And then your own personal journey, second part of the question, mm. when you had your cruciate, would have been very easy to walk away and, you know, admire you hugely for, you know, read your book. Good, very good read. You know, how you, your own personal journey, two young kids, mm. like what, what motivated you to keep, to keep coming back? Obviously the five in a row was a carrot, but just yeah. two. Yeah. yeah, no, good, good question. I suppose the Dublin thing, like, um, we, we we always believed that we we had we we hadn't reached our potential, you know, and, and there was a group of people there that that weren't willing and a management there that believed that we could do more and it's about it's about that belief. If if you're a manager or you're a team that didn't believe they were gonna get there, you just kinda of, you stay in that kind of mid mid level tier and you never get there. But from when you say what do you learn from it, it's 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 making sure that here, yeah, it's 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 cliche though, but but making sure that you're learning from it. In 2010, we analysed that game. And um, in 2010, one of the games, I remember actually just when you say learning from it, we shipped five goals in the Leinster uh, against Mead. And we looked at every every goal. And every time there was a f- 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 four to five came from freeze or sidelines, we had a Dublin player turning his back or giving out to a referee or something. We weren't tuned in. We weren't. So our lesson for that year, and I know we, we didn't get over the line in, in, in 2010, but we were picking up these things that you have to be always tuned in, always on top, never give it a second. So we just started learning these little lessons in the style of Earwigs, obviously in 2009. Like, they all were massive learning curves and, and very rarely does, does somebody become a success without having several failures before that. You hear many business people and billionaires or millionaires, you hear that were bankrupt or learned their lessons prior to actually having their success. You sometimes have to have those losses and those learnings um, to, to actually get to get there in success. And it was the same for me. I, I did my cruise shit on my personal journey. It was if I didn't ha- if I didn't have that 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 time to actually think to work on other areas of my games, I always looked at, at injury as an opportunity because we train together as a team. We do the same amount of kicking. We do the same amount of, amount of you get a certain amount of touches of the ball. How can you be better? How do you how can you push past people if you're doing the exact same as them? So the the injury I always look at an injury as an opportunity to get better than the people because you've time to spend time at, at other things. So I always looked at uh, whenever I get asked, do you have time to ask, to talk to kids that are that are upset that they have an injury, a cruciate usually. Um, people reach out to me at different times. And I always say, look at it as an opportunity, like what other areas of your game? Can you, if you're if you're the right age, can you get after the gym? I, I bulked up, I took a, um, I became back a, a different player. I hit the gym, I was 19 years of age. I was a scrawny little little 18 year old and I did my knee. I came back in, t- in when I was 20, 20 a year later or eight, 12 months later. Um, a different animal, you know, and, and I'd, I'd spent time, I, I, I kicked with only my left foot for the, the six weeks before I could actually kick with my right because my, my right one was my injured one. So I came back, I'm much more accurate. I, I spent a lot of time on my game. So I, I wouldn't have made it, I don't think, without that injury to the levels that, that I, 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 I got to for so long. Like I wasn't a, a naturally gifted footballer. Everything I, 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 I achieved, I had to do from a lot of hard work. I spent a, a bag of balls, down, down in Westmanstown, um, or, or around the back in Plunkets, or even down in Bridges, job time in your club, Brian, um, or your your past your past club, um, spending ball, spending time working on my skills, and and I realised early that I wasn't. My brother Alan was one of these natural kids that came through, seventeen, straight into the team at eighteen, just took to it like duck like water. There's always those type of people, but I I didn't make my debut till I was twenty three. But I worked very hard at it, and I was determined. Um, 
and I, I, I had a, obviously a long career after that. But I always say, when you say about resilience, it's about, and it t- takes a mindset and not, not every kid has it or every business person has, has that mindset to actually bounce back from it. But if you, if you understand or look at things from a different point of view and say, how do I learn from this? Take it as a learning. Like I don't, I'm never afraid of failure. I'm never afraid of, 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 of losing. Um, because there's so much growth in that, like that's where you, that's where you get your biggest biggest lessons. Um, easy to say in a call like this, and obviously in, pr- in practice, there's a lot of stress that goes around challenges or losses in, in the business world. Um, as a, and I've been there, I've had loads of success and loads of loads of challenges there as well. Um, so yeah, it's about looking at it, looking at it, always learning, and then I've never been afraid to to just to take a chance on something and to, and to, and to grow from it, you know. Yeah, that's no, great. Yeah, thanks, Brendan. No, there's one here actually from a psychol psychology point of view. It's a um, good question from Annette. How, have you had any advice for not letting work affect your home life when you log off uh, for the day, especially when you don't have to commute at the end of the day? Like, you think you mentioned that people are nearly always switched on now. Um, so, just suppose there'll be a lot of people on the call, nearly everyone, I presume, working yeah. from home. Yeah, and it's that performance trinity piece. I got a bit of a lesson now. My wife would say that I, I don't always practice it, not like 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 anyone. I'm just I'm just uh, I don't have all the answers, but um, I definitely feel when you look at the three things that are most important to you. So family, obviously, massively important to me. And the kids, like I I, I leave the office here. I, I actually am lucky enough to my my office is in five within five k in my home. Uh, so in the morning I spend time. We we dovetail for an hour each uh, on and off with Kira, and then in the afternoon I get down here to do a bit of work, and I I leave here at half five, and I and I. And I just switch off until I put the lads lads down. I have dinner, have time, just sit with the lads doing nothing or just playing games like that. And that's really important to me. And then I can switch back on in the afternoon. But the, as I said, the three things are important. To you. They're not never going to be equal time because work takes a big big lot of our time. As a sports person, it took a massive amount of hours because it was all in our in our own time. And family life obviously took took to, to hit on that, but. The, 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 the answer is to be present or to, 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 when you're doing something try and switch off the other things and if you're present at that moment you can get a lot of value from it so when you get home you now I get sucked into the times so I'm taking out the phone I'm reading emails on the couch when the lads are watching cartoons or whatever but if you can if you can devote a small period of time to that to that thing that you're trying to do um, that's where you get the value from and that's where um, where I think it's really important to really switch off. Like you have to have that that switch off and starting to go for walks uh, with, with the family at half five, six o'clock just around the block. Really nice just to get a clear headspace. Like little simple tip, tips and tricks like that are very important even though they seem, seem small. They're massive, especially this time when we're, we're cooped up at home a lot. Um, just getting out and, and doing those different things and making you feel like you've actually if you can go to bed at night and you feel like you've 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 touched you've 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 had a touch point with the things that are important to you, even if you, you do have a long day and you might only get I might only get half an hour with um with the kids before bed, as long as you feel like you've you've you you you've spent a bit of time and you feel like you've you've got that piece ticked that day, um, there's a lot of value to that. Have you anything to add on that, just in the? Um, I think I think I think I think Bernard put it really well. But I, I think that probably the biggest challenge we have um, is, you know, I I would challenge anyone here is like, how often do you turn your Wi-Fi off at home? Mm. You know, I, 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 you know, and I mean, like, and I'm 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 a total hypocrite, like, because I'm exactly the same. But it's it's that thing. I mean, there are all sorts of cool. It seems counterintuitive, but there are cool apps out there to help you switch off technology. Like there are things you can put on your phone that will block all incoming anything for, you know, you can set a timer that allows you then to focus solely on what you're doing. One of the things that I would have done all the time with athletes was the idea of putting blue screens away at a certain time in the evening and then not looking at them Mm. because blue screens are the kind of, they're they're the enemy of sleep. You know, the the, the blue screens like, like phones, laptops, iPads, whatever, um, they release serotonin which is the opposite of what you need. You need melatonin to sleep. So, you know, it's how do you, how do you give yourself opportunities in the day to actually breathe? And one thing that I would say that, it, again, is counterintuitive, but it's regularly in your day, get up from the computer and go for a walk. Go out, just Even if it's just out to the garden for 10 minutes. It's something, I, I did a thing with, uh, I was working with a guy, he was a CEO of one of the biggest companies in Canada. And, um, I, I, I was working with him as a kind of an executive coach and he asked me to help him. He was grossly overweight, incredibly brilliant man, but grossly overweight. And he felt that his life 
his health was suffering, his family life was suffering because his work hours were ridiculous. And when he got home, he was continuing the work. Like, and, and this was back, you know, back in the old days where you had a commute. But he, he started, we, we, we worked on kind of basic simple routines that could make life a little bit easier for him. And one of the things we did was we kind of established what's important in your life, what really, really matters. And then how do you devote time to that? So what he did was he turned his phone off half an hour from home and his commute, he turned his phone off so that when he walked in the door home, he was in family mode, he wasn't in work mode. Now, that's more challenging when we're at home, the commute isn't there. But what's, what's, the, what's the one thing we could do? Is if we have periods in our day, we say, right, I'm going to devote my time to my kids, my partner, you know, whatever. Switch the bloody thing off. Take a break. Because we, we all suffer. It's, it's funny, there is a psychological issue now called um, um, uh, mobile anxiety, which is like this fear of what am I missing if I don't have my phone in my hand? Like, oh, Jesus, there's 10 emails. But in reality, how many of those emails are absolutely urgent? I have, I have a thing now where Michelle, who's one of the founding members of Pep Talk with Bernard, Michelle and I work really well together. But I regularly get emails from Michelle at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning. Because Michelle is like me. We just kind of, we, we live on our own. We work kind of crazy hours. So, you know, we, and we don't mind that because we know it's not something that we need to get into at 1 o'clock in the morning. But I would never do that to the people who work for me. Because if, if my boss sends me an email at one o'clock in the morning, automatically I'm feeling anxiety that I have to address that email. And maybe it's a thing about the culture in the organization where we kind of, as an organization, you say, do you know what? I am, I, I, as a leader, I'm instructing you to put your phone away, to put your emails away and have these hours to do whatever it is you have to do. And one of the things we've done in Pep Talk is we've, on Wednesdays now, we have no meetings, no Zoom meetings on a Wednesday. We've, we, we, we found that we were spending every day nine to five or six, seven, whatever it is, on Zoom calls, which meant that the only time we had to actually get work done was in the evening time or in the weekends. So we've, we've gotten rid of our Wednesday calls so that we actually have time to just clear our heads and do some work. And I think it's about creating that structure. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully that helps, you know, and, and we have a bunch of ideas and I'm happy to share stuff with you guys after the call that might help on that stuff. And Dan, there's one just for, from pep talk point of view about I suppose um, the challenges employees are facing now in lockdown I suppose and do you think it'd be beneficial to um, run a staff survey to discover how a company can assist and support them? I know if you want to run through quickly Bernard what, what some of the features of, of pep talk do for for companies, you know, you signed up at AIB and haven't finished an AIB there last year mm. uh, to join IMS here in Galway. Um, you know, a lot of the guys are very happy with it and it's, it's, it's going very well to help them. Yeah, <clears throat> I suppose... Yeah, the, the staff the, survey, yeah. Yeah, right. well, the, the staff surveys obviously are, are a great picture um, or a pulse in the organisation of where, where, where you're at. Um, Organizations for a long time have felt that staff surveys and understanding where they're at is sometimes ha <laughs> the job done. Where Pep Talk is trying to be the solution in the middle, as you as you say, and trying to actually help organizations and, and positively nudge the organization in the right in the in the right way. Um, so yeah, like there's there's loads there's loads of things you can do. Obviously, we've chatted through some of them, um, making people feel feel like the, the things that are that are struggling. Innovation is struggling. Junior people, junior people in junior roles, are struggling because they don't have. I mean, I'm an accountant. I came through accountancy, and I had a fellow beside me. I asked a million questions a day as I learned my trade. That's not there for for for, for junior people that are, are, are any level that are still learning their trade. Um, so there's loads of those type of challenges, setting up peer-to-peer -peer groups for them to have a place, having, making sure they have, a, they, they have a place for feedback, that they can actually event or make feel that they're supported. Um, loads of different tips, tips and tricks like that. And I suppose, yeah, Pep Talk is, is, a, is, is a platform. It's game fights on your, in your hand. It's an app that is there on demand. So if, if it is stress or anxiety or worry or, or mental health that is there at three o'clock in the morning for a meditation, for a sleep. It's, and content, it, it is content, but content isn't just a solution. There's a world of content out there. More importantly for me about what, where Pep, Pep Talk is going and, and where, where we're, we're adding value with the likes of AIB, it's that connection piece. It's that teams feel supported. 
we did a we did a really uh, well. Niall led a, led an amazing um, initiative over the summer where I think there was a hundred videos from managers in AIB around different challenges, tips and tricks about remote working, things I learned, things I've struggled with, vulnerability, don't have the answers, and just just the scale of that kind of movement of, of kind of culturally is just massive you know what i mean and um no and, and further on your side yeah, just on that one. i think i think just on the survey point i mean we're we're obviously investigating all sorts of different ways of of providing companies with metrics to help them understand you know like i, I don't like the term soft skills but understand that, that you know there's there's different ways to drive people to performance i think surveys are <coughs> excuse me i think surveys are very important but I think there has to be a culture in the company of trust that if somebody does respond to the survey, they're being listened to. And I, I would have done surveys with every athlete and every team I've worked with. I would do surveys, but then I would sit down with the individuals on, off the back of those surveys and try to understand what it was that they were trying to tell us. Because what, what the danger is, is that if you do a survey and you get eight out of 10 people say, oh, we want to do a remote uh, camping trip or whatever, right? Who knows? Um, that's great. So you go, okay, let's do that because the survey tells us that's what our people want. But there's two people out of that 10 who don't want it. And they're then feeling they're being forced to do something they're not really into. And it's that understanding of, you know, how do we bring it back to the individual and what the individual needs? And that's really what, what we're trying to do with Pep Talk is we're trying to give managers tools to engage their teams, but also provide each member of the team with personal solutions on you know it's not just about well-being it's about bringing your how like i suppose the simple the simple uh line to, to, for me to finish with is how do you allow yourself to get to a point where you're in a position to deliver your best performance and that's what every company wants but you can care about your people and you can look after them and you can give them the opportunities to thrive while still having an eye on performance and that's where we see well-being as the foundation pillar of high performance yeah, it's a lovely wrap there, Bernard. If you want to just to, to wrap up with any tips for getting out the next few weeks of lockdown there? <laughs> um, no, nothing, nothing major. It's just, just having a little bit of a plan. I know that um, my, I see my wife ordered a, a, a journal there um, and something that we're, we're doing for some of the staff is just just being conscious in, in, in things that are happening and don't just, as as, as Niall said earlier, just uh, when we were chatting, he's, he's coming off a, a bout of sickness himself, um, a bit of a flu and pneumonia, like she said. He said, doing, doing the man thing and just ignoring it. Like, don't ignore the things that are, are creeping up on you, you know what I mean? Because that's where anxiety, that's where stress, and they, and they cumulate in, 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 in bigger issues. So whether you're a manager or whether you're looking after individually, be conscious of the situation you're in. Be, be, let, it, let it be okay to feel under pressure or be anxious or feel a bit under the weather or whatever it is, but also put in those little conscious kind of things about trying to get out for a walk, getting your commute in. Like you don't have a commute, but make a commute, go for a 10 minute walk before work or make sure you're getting up from your desk, making sure you're drinking enough water, making sure you're, you're, you're allowing time to connect with your employees or people you're working with for 40 hours a week. And it's not just task, task, task because you will burn out and you'll get annoyed been conscious in, in what you're doing and trying to actively do four or five things and um, sm- all the small things add up and that's fundamentally um, what's important to me and trying to just because um, you're not going to change the world overnight no one's going to go away tomorrow and do anything different but what are the couple of small things that maybe you could bring into your day or suggest to your team or suggest to your family that might just make that day a little bit easier that's that's for me is um yeah Hopefully that was a good uh, uh, yeah, no. time and all that. I know everyone has a has a day to get after, but um, thanks a million. Uh, no, look, there's a lot of there. good feedback there. Um, so look, no, just on behalf of IMS Financial, we're mortgage and uh, financial advisory here at Salt Hill. Uh, we do look mortgages, investments, and uh, as you would say there, Bernard, financial well-being as much as mental well-being. So our website is imsfinancial.ie. You know, pep talk. I'm sure there's a lot of people. On the call, if they want to get in touch um, with yourself, Bernard, it's the you know the Pep Talk website, and you know there's a demo there, and um, Niall's expertise, and you've a lot of excellent people uh, who um, who you use from the sporting world. You know, we had Kevin McMahon went down last year in Galway, given Salt Hill, Nakara, and, and Nakara FC um, coaches 
a great talk on um, sports psychology. So, again, that was arranged through you guys. So, look, I have nothing else. Noreen, if you want to just wrap up just again. If anyone... Guys, thanks so much, thanks uh, Niall and, and Bernard. Um, I suppose for us in GTC, the key takeaway was the cultural investment, Bernard, and, and you spoke so well about that trinity, the three points. And mm. it, is so, it's, it is so vital, be it in person or business life. You know, lockdown has brought the challenges to all of us, startups, scale-ups, businesses here in GTC and around. But um, you've touched on it, Niall, the connections, keeping them real conversation online and, you know, keeping the relationships alive is, is crucial. So, guys, thanks a million. Really valuable takeaways. And I hope it's okay with you, but we're, we've recorded this um, conversation so that we can share it on our, our website, gtc.ie. And again, we'll share it with Pep Talk as well. Um, so again, thanks, million. We thanks, really million. Thanks for having us. Time. Thanks to IMS Financial Services as well, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. We had um, a huge attendance, and uh, have a good day.